One more time. Great morning, Friendship Church. I said, great morning, Friendship Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad. This is the day that we can proclaim that he is alive. I don't care what all the other religions say. I don't care what every other, everybody else says. We know that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is alive. And this day being the day of Easter, we memorialize that. We praise that. We worship that he is alive. He went to the cross with all our sins, future sins, present sins, so that we could be alive. If you're happy about that, let us rejoice. Let us praise with the, with the praise team. And let us thank God that he sent his son, that we may be alive. Dear Lord, we thank you for each and everything you've done for us. We thank you, God, for your, your sacrifice for our sins, God. We thank you that you are giving us life so that we can have the freedom to know that we know that we know that all of our sins are forgiven. That we can go to somebody when we're messing up and get forgiveness and redemption for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Anybody ready to celebrate Jesus? This is that day, y'all. This is that day that we remember not only his birth, not only his life, but his death, and more importantly, his resurrection. Tell somebody he got up. He got up. So we too can get up. And let's get up with some praise and worship this morning. You ready? Y'all ready? Let's go. Friendship at home, God bless you. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we're going to celebrate. Rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Let's go. Somebody scream. Shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Here we go, here we go, here we go.
his whole life because he had me in mind. He knew that I need him as a savior. He knew I need him as a redeemer and as a Lord and as a Christ. Ah, oh, so he came. He bled. He died. But he rose. Hallelujah. And in doing so, he rescued me. Tell somebody he rescued my life. And I'm never going back. Come on, look around and tell somebody else. It was the Lord's doing. And it was marvelous in my eyes because he loved me enough to give everything for me. Hallelujah. 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 
somebody lift your hand and say, God, thank you that you rescued me. I was sinking deep in sin. I was far from the peaceful shore, y'all. Very deeply stained. But then I was sick and I thought I was going down, thought I was going under. But the master of the sea looked down where I was and reached down and he lifted me up to where I belong in him. Oh, that's a mighty good God that he would love me like that. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm never going back. To what? To what? You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm never going can we lift that praise in this room? You have, you have rescued my life. It was you, oh God. You have rescued my life. And I'm never, and I'm never, never, going never going back. Going back. Lord, you have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. Oh, you have. You have rescued my life. And I'm never. And Tell him this. Sing my response. My response is Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're my redeemer. You're my redeemer. Hey. I got to lift it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, sing that again to the Lord. My
people. Throw your hands up and say, you. It was you, oh God, that did it. It was you, oh God, that did it. him like you know he's alive Lord, I won't go back. can you praise him like he's done Lord, anything for you at all never Hallelujah. Going back. Never, no. Listen. while the while the praise dancers were while the praise dancers were worshiping the flags were flying uh, one of these nails that we depict on the cross as being what Jesus endured for us, it it fell on the floor. Bring you down just a little bit. John. It fell on the floor, and I was concerned that Sister Angie might might catch a toe on it. Then I thought about it. I thought about what Jesus went through for me. I thought about the fact that he just didn't that it did just catch him on his toe. They drove probably something quite larger than this yeah. through his hands and one through his feet. And for about six hours, 
not six minutes, six long agonizing hours. He hung suspended between heaven and earth by three nails. His back split wide open, pushing up on that nail just, just to breathe. Because crucifixion is more about asphyxiation. Your body weight hanging and you're just struggling to catch your breath. And he did that for me. That's my testimony. He did that for me. They took him down off of that cross. Put him in a borrowed tomb. Someone said it was borrowed because he wasn't going to be there long. And for three days and three nights, his body rested in that tomb. Supernatural things going on all around him. But then the Bible says, the Bible records that an angel came and rolled the stone away because Rome had posted guards to make sure that he stayed dead. But the Bible says early one Sunday morning. Come on. If I was a hooping preacher, that would be my moment right there. Early one Sunday morning. An angel came, rolled the stone away, and sat upon it. And he asked them a question. He said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here in this tomb, but he has risen, just like he said. To all the people all around the world today who are looking for meaning in dead places. Looking for God in places that God doesn't exist. I encourage you today to catch a glimpse of why we're here today. How many of you know that God answers prayer? Can I tell you just one about I pray? I was praying last night while it was raining. I said, Lord, I pray that tomorrow, should I see it, that right around 10 o'clock, the worship hour, that you'll just push the rain aside for a minute. That you'll cause the sky to open and for the sun to shine. If for nothing else, to remove an excuse of somebody, well, it's raining. Well, it ain't raining now. And so we've come into this place to worship. But here's a little history lesson for you. The Bible says that when they entered the tomb, they saw something interesting. They saw the grave clothes that he had been wrapped in, in a pile on one side but the napkin that wrapped his head was neatly folded by itself and someone asked the question always has why is that now here's an answer when a master would come and sit at his table and to eat the servants would come and serve and they would serve until the master was done So if the master got up from the table, they might assume that he was done. But if he had folded his napkin and left it on the table, that means I'm coming back. So you wonder why Jesus did what he did? He did to pay a price that you and I could not afford to bring us into a place that we would never know without him. But he's also letting us know his work isn't done yet. He's coming back. So on this Resurrection Sunday, while the world celebrates Easter, not going to get into the realities of Easter, let's just talk about the resurrection. Jesus defeated death. He endured the cross, despising the shame. And for the joy set before him, he went through it. You know what the joy was? The joy that Jesus endured the cross for was you. The fact that he knew 2,000 years ago that you would be in a place like this to worship him in spirit and in truth. And even if you don't really know him yet today, I pray you catch a glimpse of the one who defeated death for you. So we would invite you, can you make your way to the altar? 
Come on, let's have a Resurrection Sunday prayer meeting. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So that all of our singing, all of our praying, all of our preaching, we're going to gather and we're going to worship because my response is hallelujah. My response. What's your response today? What is your response to the goodness of God? You're my Come on. Hallelujah. My, my response is Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're my One O, one O, one O, one O. Come on. Oh. One more O, oh, no music. Come on, let the voice and say, Oh! One more time. One more time. Come on, O! Oh! Oh! Father God, Father God, how grateful we are that you saw fit to send your only begotten Son to suffer such an agonizing, barbaric death on our behalf. The nails that were driven in his hand, Lord, we deserve that. The beating that he endured, oh God, we deserve that. The chastisement that he endured, Father, belonged to us. And yet, he hung, he bled, and he died hour after agonizing hour oh father how easy it is for us to give up how often we're tempted father to throw in the towel when things don't go right when the job interview doesn't turn out the way we want it to when the medical diagnosis oh God is something that we never want to hear when those who say they love us treat us so bad turn their back on us and walk away. Pray, Father God, that we will just catch a glimpse of your love for us in the fact that Jesus hung for us. And yet his first words were, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father God, give us a forgiving heart. Give us, Father God, the very mind of Jesus that endured what he endured because he knew that something greater was coming. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice today, oh God, that is going through a difficult season. A time, Lord, where it feels like they've been betrayed by those who say that they were friends. For those, Lord God, that were looking to come out of a season and yet that season has just repeated itself still in bondage, still in fear, 
still living in doubt. But here we are. Through no goodness of our own, oh Lord, here we are to remind ourselves of the love that you have for us and the victory that awaits those, oh God, that put their total trust in you. I pray for those, oh God, right now that are enduring the loss of loved ones. We've witnessed the transition of our own dear sister, Beth Jackson. She fought a long, hard fight, oh God. She saw miracles work on her behalf, but yet she still succumbed to a sickness and a disease. But in Jesus' name, Father God, we know that you are sovereign over it all. That no matter what we go through, oh Lord, you're right there with us. Lord, so whether you take us out of it or whether you show up in the midst of it, Father, we will bless you because you alone are worthy. No other king went the distance like you did. No one else, oh God, could pay the price like you did. No one else could die for us like you did. No one else could shed their blood for us like you did. And even if they did, Lord, it wouldn't, it would fall short. Because by the precious blood of Jesus, you have washed us. You have cleansed us. You've established us as your own children. So we belong to you, Father, and we just say thank you. I ask your blessings, Lord, upon anyone that might be listening today that still has questions about this Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you'll make yourself known for all of the preaching that we can do, all of the singing, all of the praying, Lord, unless you speak and make your own self known, someone might leave without you. But you came, oh God. To seek and to save those that were lost. You said you would leave the 90 and 9 and go and find that one. So if there's even one here today, Lord, I pray that you will speak, whether in a still small voice or whether it is like thunder, oh God, from the sky, that we might know that you love us so much that you gave your life for us and that you took it back again. You showed us how to live. You showed us how to die. And you showed us how to rise again. Resurrection power is the blessing that belongs to your children. So I pray, Father God, resurrection over every dead thing that has died that you were not done with. I pray, oh God, over dead dreams. Pray, oh God, over dead relationships. I pray, oh God, over everything that has died that you desire to raise up today. Restore us, revive us, renew us, and be glorified in our lives each and every day, but especially on this day. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, amen, amen, and praise God.
Hallelujah. Listen, we got word this morning. One of our worship team, Sister Courtney Thurgood, was on the way here across the freeway or across the street and her car hydroplane and she ended up hitting the, the barrier, hitting the divider. She's fine. The, the, come on, she's fine. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So the paramedics or the police were able to get her out of the vehicle. But I just want to remind you of how fragile this life is. Some odd reason I was thinking about the people going to work. Was it in New Jersey? Baltimore. Where that ship hit the bridge. Just going through life and all of a sudden people just snatched out of this world. We should never just live in fear of something happening, and that's why, that's why we get right. But one of these days, this Bible story is going to prove itself to be true or not. Either what we stand on as the resurrection of Christ actually happened, or we're all just going through the motions. And the Bible says that if Jesus didn't rise, then we're all still lost in our sin. And the wages, I'm already preaching this morning, the wages of sin is death. So God gives us opportunity after opportunity, time after time, just to get it right before it is everlasting too late. Had another chance to sit with my godmother, Arzella Valentine, 97 years old. She shared, I don't think she was, she was going through some very difficult times, physically, just some things. She was asking God, you know, whether it was her time to go or not. And I told her, I said, you got a lot more living to do. Because me just sitting in the midst of someone who's, whose life is spanned so long that still can remember and still can relate as the generations pass, I'm just grateful for every single one of you that have spoken into my life, every single one of you that have been a blessing to me. My prayer is that this day, that God will bring about a resurrection of what has died before its time in your life. There are certain things that need to die. There are certain things that don't hold any value in us but I believe that sometimes Satan will have Satan has killed something off in you a joy a hope a dream and my prayer is that perhaps even by this you will know that the God that I serve is still able I pray resurrection over the thing that you thought had died and that God will, by His sovereign power, in the very near future, begin to allow you to see signs of life again. You thought it was over. God says it's not over. And if you just desire that in your life, can you just put, if that's for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, to those in the house and those online, again, we welcome you to the worship experience of the Friendship Pasadena church family we are so pleased that on this resurrection Sunday that you saw fit either to tune in or to show up and we pray and believe that you're here on purpose and for purpose that there's something God wants you to know there's something God wants you to realize that he's not done with you yet but he still has incredible things in store for your life this week's prayer theme is taken from St. John chapter 3 verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life I got to throw verse 17 in there for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved the world is already under the condemnation of sin but Jesus came to tell you I ain't mad just trust in me 
and I'll change your life forever. We're praying for, again, the sister of the family of Sister Beth Jackson transitioned from earth to glory this past Tuesday. She truly fought the good fight of faith, and her homegoing services are scheduled this coming Saturday, April 16th, here at Friendship at 11 a.m. If you're able to come and just be an encouragement to the family, if you can just, just send your prayers and blessings to them, and to everyone that's on our sick and our shut-in list, those that we know about, those that we don't. Is that me or is that something else? We're going to work on through it in the name of Jesus. Uh, Brother Joey Evans um, is in the hospital with walking pneumonia. Let's pray for his con continued healing. And for everybody, those again, those online, those we know about, and those that we don't, we're continue to pray for them. Um, if anyone is still interested in purchasing tickets for the celebration to honor Deacon Luke Walker on Saturday, April 28th, please see Sister Flo Berry, wherever she might be, uh, because again, um, it's, it, it's overdue that we as a church, come on, and that the community honors uh, Brother Luke Walker. Man, just, 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 just wave at us, brother. Hallelujah. That's a walking testimony. That's a walking testimony of God's goodness and grace in the midst of his people. Um, attention all young adults, uh, Pastor Jacques would like to meet with you directly after service for a brief meeting. We are greatly encouraged by our young adult ministry. Um, I, I, come on. I've, I, I, I've said this, that our youth and our young adults are not our future. They are our now. They are our now. And we are not just seeking to do events for them. We're seeking to create that atmosphere where across the generations that we do honor our, our senior saints, but we're raising up a generation of young people in love with the Lord. And we're giving them the freedom and the liberty to express themselves within the parameters of holiness and within the parameters of God's, God's word. But we have already created a brand new wineskin. And God is pouring new wine into that. And we're excited about what is coming. Um, we also want to continue to encourage those of you who serve to continue to serve. And for those of you that have yet to find a place in the friendship family when you where you can serve just ask one of your elders ask one of your pastors ask one of your deacons where can I assist in the building of the friendship Pasadena church family and we know that you will help us to grow and help us to do the things that uh, honor God the most so we have began a um, process again the brainchild of uh, Pastor Gary where we identify and honor those that are serving well. And we're we also asking you to share with your elders, share with your pastors, share with your deacons who you believe we should honor. But uh, Pastor Gary is going to come up right now. Can you receive him as we again honor someone with an excellence in service award microphone? Is there one anywhere? Uh, can I grab yours? Pastor John. Good morning, friendship family. Good morning. Good morning, friendship family. Good morning. Good morning, friendship family. Good morning. Amen, amen, amen. Every week I try to come up with a little something for anticipation so you might know who it is we're honoring. Pasadena is known as the city of what? Roses. So who could that possibly be that would have roses in their name? Or maybe even Rose in their name? Dr. Rose Edgar. I don't know if she's here today. Her elder is here. Oh, yeah. How about that? <laughs> On behalf of our senior pastor, Pastor Smith, the elder council, as the director of the discipleship ministry, we know you lead our, your mother leads our prayer 
team and group and all that good stuff. So we want to say thank you for your service and excellence. On behalf of... <laughs> say something on behalf of your mother, please. I just want to say, as you can see, I'm not Dr. Rose Edgar. But thank you very much. She loves this church. She gets excited about this church. And every morning when she can't come, she'll call myself or my wife and say, can't make it today. But I'm like, that's all right, Mom. Just watch it on television. But she thanks you. I know she will thank you. I thank you very much. Appreciate it. God bless. Praise God. Listen, this is also our fifth Sunday, and it's our missions Sunday. And I believe that that is perhaps the perfect alignment of what God has required for us. Because when Jesus rose, what is called the Great Commission, begins with these words. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth is given into my hand. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, all ethnos, all ethnicities, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and then teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And Jesus said, and lo, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. I heard a preacher like to say it said like this. If there is no low, if there is no go, then there will be no low. Jesus said, if you go, then low, I'll be with you. But if we don't go, don't be expecting your low. So on this Mission Sunday, uh, can you receive Elder Jamal Palmer? as he just gives us some insights as to what it is. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Same microphone, brother? What I just do with it? Ah, imagine that. Great minds. <laughs> Good morning, friendship, and happy Resurrection Sunday. And I'm here on behalf of the mission board, which is it's a little challenging for me today because I was like, it's Resurrection Sunday. Can I really, how do we tie the mission into that? But first, what I'm going to do is read some of the ministries that we do and then go over a scripture, and then I'm going to tie it into Resurrection Sunday as I best I can. So first, I wanted to introduce the Calmore Scholarship Fund, which is um, going to be talked about later by Elder David Harrison. And basically what that is, we're raising money for the youth to go to college. So if you guys are wanting to donate with that, you can do it with your tithes and envelopes and see David Harrison after for information. The other ministries we do are Walter Hoving Home, YWAM Haiti Ministries, Family Promise, and the Clothing Ministry. With that, I read Matthew 25, 35 through 40, where I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did you see a stranger and invite, when did you see a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did you see sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And to me, that was, it really jumped out, because for those of you who are familiar with Family Promise, we bring families here once a quarter to house them and feed them of people who don't have a place to go. The Walter Hovington home, they help abused and addicted women get off drugs and improve their self. The clothing ministry, it speaks for itself. They're clothing people in need of clothing. And then it brought me to how does that relate to um, Easter Sunday? And for some of you, you guys received a cross today as you came in. And it hit me because as I was talking to Shelly, who did these, you guys thank her after for the crosses. But she mentioned to me that she was trying to make them all the same, but they were all uniquely different because the way the wood and stuff came out. Just kind of like all of you are here today. We're all uniquely different. But the way that tied into Easter to me was interesting because some people will go home with this and it'll be a nice Easter trinket. 
Someone else will go home with it, and it'll remind them of Resurrection Sunday, 2024. Somebody else, maybe a few, will go home and look at it, and they will remember Jesus died for me and rose. But maybe one or two will look past this cross, and Jesus will be resurrected in them. He'll become alive today, not 2,000 years ago, because there's some of us now who have that boulder over our hearts that's way bigger than then that we need to remove. So I just wanted to, you to think of that because I hope and pray that someone today can have a personal Resurrection Sunday. And with that, I wish you happy Mission Sunday and happy personal Resurrection Sunday. So thank you. Amen. Amen. I truly thank God for Elder Jamal and his dedication to our mission efforts. Friendship, you, you, you make it possible for us to do what we do by sowing into this work called friendship with your time, your talent, and your treasure. So as even you, you prepare whatever you might have brought by way of an offering, a Resurrection Sunday offering, tithes and offerings, I just want to again uh, to inform you just another reason to celebrate. 626 Prospect in South Pasadena, 12 units being designated for affordable housing. The Pasadena Friendship CDC, an extension of the Friendship Pasadena Church family, closed escrow on that property. That now belongs to us. Y'all acting like that's no, that's some little thing. Come on, this is our first foray into that world. God is opening doors and moving mountains. We're going to change the landscape of cities because of what God is doing in this place. And again, you make that entirely possible. So as we get ready to sow into this place called friendship, I also want to take time to acknowledge any first or second time. If this is your first time with us today. Would you just kindly just stand so we can see you and depending upon the amount of folks, God bless you, sir, that we may ask you, come on, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Please remain standing just for a moment because we want to give you some information about us and we want to get a little bit of information from you. So if you could just give us your name and what might have brought you, starting right there, my dear sister. You live across the street? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, we coming by for dinner to your house. Come on. Praise God. Yes. My Texas people. Amen. And? That's how y'all supposed to do that. Shout out your church. Shout out your pastor. Giving honor to God. Come on, somebody. Right here in front. Yes, yes. Jake and. Amira and. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Yes. Okay. First time in the house. Welcome. God bless you. Amen. Right here. Yes. My name is Kayla. I'm the friend of the people. All right. All right. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Blessings. Yes, sir. He's not here at the moment. <laughs> But thanks for coming anyway, my brother. Yes. Amen. Switch it up. Amen. Welcome. Welcome. Yes, sir. All right. Praise God. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And I'm missing anybody. Well, on behalf of the entire Friendship Pasadena Church family, we welcome you today. We believe that there is a word and a, 
a move of God that he wants to make known to you. I'm going to stand in agreement with Elder Jamal that there might be a resurrection encounter that you have with God today. That beyond and in the midst of every song that we've sang, every prayer that we've prayed, every expression of gratitude that we've shown, that you will catch a glimpse of the living Jesus Christ. That he'll be more than just a story in a book or more than just someone that you've heard about. But God will make himself known to you. And so for the Friendship Pasadena Church family that are right next to you, to our visitors and our guests, can you just touch them on the shoulder and say, welcome, thank you for coming, God, God bless you. And immediately after service to our visitors, we want to invite you to go to our Welcome Center, uh, Luke Wave. To all of our, our, our guests, we have a Welcome Center with some re refreshments. I would love to meet you. I will be over there. I'd love to shake your hand, and you'll meet a few of our, our pastors and our elders. But again, welcome to Friendship Pasadena. Y'all glad for what God is doing? Come on and give Him some glory. So now is the time, now is the time that we receive from God the free will offerings we don't ever lift an offering. We don't take an offering. We receive offerings from willing hands. You are the financial steward of every single penny that comes into your financial control. You may be somewhere to say, well, just give it and trust God. I leave that up to you. But we would invite you to examine what it is that we're seeking to do here in the Friendship Pasadena Church family. So that when you sow that gift, you can realize this is fertile soil. We're not only supporting the ministries within the four walls of friendship, as, as you've heard through our CDC, we're reaching out into the community through the outreach ministries of the Hoving Home and the Family Promise and the community uh, closet that we have here. We're seeking to make an impact not only in Pasadena, but all around the world. So a tithe is 10% of what comes into your financial control, and an offering is above and beyond that. But whatever you sow today, sow it as a seed and believe that God is going to return it. So take that gift, take that offering, raise it before the Lord, and let's confess our faith what we know God is about to do. This is the offering I bring to God, the seed of faith I sow. I give it in faith. I give it in love. I give it in obedience. I believe the promise that he has made and I shall reap the harvest that he has promised, however he chooses to bring it my way. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, we bless you and we thank you for the abundance that you've given us that we can now return a portion of it back to you. I pray, Lord, that you bless the gift and the giver. I pray today, oh God, that you'll bless even those who have a desire but may not have the means. Increase their faith, increase their store of seed. In Jesus' name, Amen. You are now in the hands of your ushers. Somebody scream in the room. Somebody scream in the room. Huh? You're still going to use the pulpit. This is the day that we remember that Jesus came, that we might have life, and that we might have it more abundantly. So if anybody in the field is grateful for abundant life, somebody clap your hands and give God glory and celebrate right along with us.
bring that down. Listen, 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 listen. Stay there, stay there. Watch it. Listen. I know, I know, I know. Listen, y'all bring it down a little bit. I know you got on your Easter best. I know you're afraid about getting it wrinkled or sweating it out. Come on, somebody. But Jesus Christ rose from the dead for you. He gave his life for you. And if you're worried about anything, he said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So I'm going to give you just another chance. I'm going to give you just another chance. Can you go back and bring whatever you need to? Come on. Somebody say yes, 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 Lord. Say yes, Lord. Determined to be cute today. I understand. But I want you. I, I want you to. something for our children our children about to bless us well come on in bring them on up here can you receive our littlest saints come on can you receive our littlest saints little unexpected surprise oh y'all just clap like you see kids in church all the time you better bless the Lord in this house Come on, they just keep on coming. Woo. I'm going to see this myself. White mic. White mic. White mic. Thank you. 
my mic, please. Once again, good morning, church. Your children would love to remind you of the reason we are here. Not that you need to be reminded, but out of the mouth of children. Amen? Amen. He suffered. He died. He rose again. And now they have something to present to you. So if you would hand out, hold out your hand, they have something. Let's go, everyone. They have something they'd like you to take home to remember why we celebrate today. Give them a big hand as they come. Let's clap it up for our children. Praise God. Just a, just a little reminder that we are raising up the next generation of believers. Our children, our young adults, our senior saints. Everybody in this house has a part to play. Can you bless them even as they leave the room? Hallelujah. I don't know if everybody has the same one. Mine is Ephesians 1.20. God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sat him at God's right side in the heavens. I do believe we're about to touch on that in a minute. But again, I'm so very grateful for everybody, again, to our online audience, to our in person audience, I pray today that this will be more than just a Sunday that we just said, okay, I was down at the church for Easter or down at the church for Resurrection Sunday, but that you generally have an encounter. Was there something other than that, uh, that, that you want to share, brother? White mic, please. Testing. There you go. Yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody, you know, we had our young people out here. And we just remind you about the Lloyd uh, Calmore Scholarship Fund. And uh, what it is, is uh, the church, uh, Lloyd Calmore and his family established a scholarship for children, for students who are continuing their education. So we have applications on our website uh, for those who are continuing their education. There's some money's available for you. You know, I, I went to school, it was kind of expensive, so <laughs> maybe you could use some money too. But uh, the applications are due on May 12th. Uh, please. And also, besides that, uh, very important because these scholarships, you have to be a member. We, we, but also, we, all, we want to recognize students who are continuing if they're graduating. So anybody, so any student that's going from K through college and you're going, so to, going to another part, maybe you're going to junior, what, junior high school or you're going to college, let us know. So we can give you a little something so you can keep on growing with and keep on moving forward in your education. So uh, thank you. My name is Elder David Hairston. That's one of my downline ministries, so thank you. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. And also, on your envelopes, you can donate money. Yes. <laughs> it's a scholarship fund. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, could, could, could the elders present, could uh, you guys stand up so that your congregation, again, will know uh, there's an elder, elder, elder Williams. Uh, those of you kind of in the back, um, your, your, your elder council uh, is determined to make sure that friendship is operating at optimum efficiency, that we actually are doing everything with excellence. Each elder has a downline ministry um, with ministry leaders in place. And we're seeking to connect the body of Christ so that if there is a need of any kind, 
you can get directly with your elder. You can come directly to your pastoral staff. I thank God again for uh, Pastor Gary, our discipleship pastor, Pastor Jacques, our young adult pastor, Pastor Kevin uh, McDaniels in his absence. Uh, stand up, brother. Um, who is our fa fa family life pastor. And what it is that, that God has allowed us to do is put together a framework of leadership where we can encourage the body of Christ to grow beyond even our imagination. So please pray for your elder council, pray for your pastoral staff, pray for your deacons and deaconess who also are the front line. They're out there listening to the heartbeat of the church. There, there should not be one need in this house that is not at least spoken to and at best ministered to. We don't want anybody to be a part of the, the friendship family and feel like you were overlooked or feel like you're not valuable. So from our youngest saints to our senior most saints, we believe that what God is doing in this season of friendship is going to be incredible and that the glory of this present house shall be greater than the glory of the former house. Can you thank God for your leaders and for those that are serving well? And apparently, just before I get to the message, I may have misspoken. The services for Sister Beth Jackson is uh, April 6th and not the 16th. If I said the 16th, please uh, forgive me, but it's this coming Saturday, April 6th, here in the sanctuary. So thank you, S S Sister Bernetta, for making sure, again, that we're doing everything. But come on, y'all. Let's uh, get into this, this, this word. God is still answering my prayers, so before the clouds uh, come back and rain falls again, Let's get into this message. Take your Bible, take your Bible app, take the means by which you access the Word of God, raise it before the Lord, and only if you believe these words, let's say them together. This is my Bible. This is God's Word speaking to me. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. It is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. With it I wage war against the enemy of my soul. I will fight the good fight. I will contend for the faith. I will uphold the honor of God in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. On this Resurrection Sunday, the cross is unoccupied, the tomb is empty, Satan is defeated, and Jesus is victorious. The resurrection of Jesus Christ really is the greatest story ever told, first and foremost, because it's true. It's historically accurate, it's biblically accurate, and it is spiritually fulfilling. And also because those of us who believe in the completed work of Jesus know that we no longer need to fear death or to worry about what happens afterward. Songwriter said, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. More contemporary writer said, so many people doubt him, but I can't live without him. That is why I love him so, because he is so real to me. And now that I've been touched by the Lord, I've got to go and tell everybody how good God is to those that believe. While dying on the cross, Jesus uttered seven last sayings, known as the seven last words from the cross. And each of them was a message in and of itself. You usually hear these words on Good Friday, where many churches around the country have Good Friday services. And different pastors, different ministers will take each word. But again, as Jesus hung on the cross, he was still ministering. What looked like the end of his life, Jesus was still pouring out truth. He was still demonstrating life lessons for us. So many people turned away from him when they saw where he was going. They were surrounding him when he was giving them free bread and free fish. They were surrounding him when he was showing up at the hospital and raising the dead and healing the sick and opening the blinded eyes. They were thronging him when they could get something from him. But when it became apparent that he was going somewhere, somewhere cruel and somewhere bitter, he was going to an end that they did not think was appropriate for someone that they thought should be a king. Then they began to, one by one, they began to abandon him. As a matter of fact, even his own disciples, when it got rough, when it came time to arrest Jesus, the Bible said that all of them fled in different directions. And that's because God came to do something that not everybody understood. 
Jesus that did not come, and he does not come into your life just to make your life better. He's not just there to, to heal your sicknesses and your diseases, which he will do. He's not just there to give you comfort and peace in the midst of chaos, which he can do. He came to do something far more important, and that was to deliver us from the death sentence that lies on all humanity. That's one of the difficult things about this, about this message that even some churches seem to avoid. I was listening to a discussion. There's a well-known ministry who decided that they were not going to, in their marketing to the community, that they were not going to use the word resurrection or redemption or sin. They were going to talk about Easter. Easter is much more marketable. It's much more palatable to people that aren't quite ready, perhaps, to face the, the sin issue. Not quite ready to realize what it is that Jesus actually came to do. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin or a sin offering for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'm going to ask you, Brett, just kind of to stay there, brother, just so I can keep myself in the spirit that I want to stay in. Because Jesus died for a reason. The reason that he died was because there was a death sentence on humanity that stretched all the way back from Adam. Adam was the first man made in the image and likeness of God, and Eve was made in the image of her husband. And God had done some, made some incredible promises to them. You know the story of Adam and Eve, I, I hope so. They were made in God's image. It says, and his likeness. And the friendship family knows because I've gone into length trying to let us know that there's a difference in those two words. Adam and Eve bore the, the image of God. The word image means, means likeness. It means the, 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 the similitude, the form of. And so physically, if God was to have a physical form, they were perhaps the embodiment of what an invisible God would look like. But then the Bible also said that they were made in his likeness. And the word likeness actually means brilliance. It means brightness. It means glory. So Adam and Eve were not just created from the earth, and yes, they were, and they were made in the image of God. But when God breathed into them, they became like God. They were made alive with the very life essence of God him, himself. That's how they were able to interact with God like they were. That's how they were able to stand in God's presence and hear his voice and, 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 and walk with God like God wants us to walk with him. But the moment that sin came into the world, the moment that the initial man lost his place, the Bible says, the word lets us know that the light went out, that Adam and Eve's natural eyes opened. And they began to realize who they were in the natural. God never had intended for them to know what they couldn't do. God never had intended for them to know any weakness and limitation. He said, if you just keep your eyes fixed on me, nothing will be impossible for you. But the moment that they sinned, they became self-aware. And they looked at themselves and said, oh my God, we are, we're naked. And it's interesting, you know the story. God calls for Adam and Eve. Adam! And I think this is one of the saddest laments in all of the Bible. God calls out to his creation. God calls out to the, to the pinnacle of his creativity. A man made in his own image. He made everything after his own kind. He made fish and beasts and everything. But then, in order for man to be unique, God made him in his own image and placed him at the top of his creative abilities. But then God came and looked for his creature. He looked for his creation. He said, Adam, where are you? In other words, Adam was not where he should have been. Adam had left the place that God put him in. And so now here comes Adam crawling out the bushes, covered in fig leaves. And Adam's response is, I heard you in the garden. See, just hearing God is not enough. Because you hear about God and you hear from God. When the birds sing, you're hearing from God. When the wind blows, you're hearing from God. When the rain falls, when, the, when a warm breeze caresses your face, that's God speaking to you. 
That is called the natural witness of God. Have this conversation with someone at the front door dealing with people that don't believe. They believe in evolution and the Big Bang. And they somehow feel that science and, and our faith sometimes don't interact. I ask the question, who's to say that when God created everything that there wasn't a Big Bang? Who's to say that God didn't just create everything with a big bang? But when you start realizing, well, well, it's, it's, it, the, the gases came together. Well, where'd the gases come from? The energy came together. Where'd that come from? Who made the things that came together and all of a sudden out of chaos created perfection? I heard somebody say that to believe in evolution is to believe that a, that a, that a, that a tornado can go through a, 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 junkyard and build a Rolls Royce. When you look at a fingers on a brand new baby, when you look in the eyes of a friend close enough to see the complexity of just the human eyeball, when you look at x-rays and see the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made, you believe that all of that perfect creation came out of chaos. And I believe that there was a creative God that did it because he loved us. And I'm the crazy one? But when Adam sinned, that sin passed on to all of us. And so the Bible tells us that all of us have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. You may be living an incredible life. You may have everything that you believe the world wants you to have. But until you realize that you can't take any of that with you. That when you die, your essence does not just return to the universe. Because the universe was created by someone. The Bible says it is given unto us once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so Jesus came to make right what Adam made wrong. Jesus came to fix eternally what Adam had eternally broken. Jesus is called the second Adam. So at the end of his physical life, after 33 years of living and three years of ministry, Jesus now, for, for no crimes of his own, but according to the divine plan of God, never did anything wrong, and yet for some reason, the people that he came to, the Bible says he came into his own, and his own received him not. But to those of us that have, God gave the ability for us to be called sons and daughters of Almighty God. See, when I call God my, my, my father, it's not because I learned that in a song. It's because I've got the relationship with, with him. Religion without relationship is idolatry. That if you've come for any other reason other than Jesus Christ, I want to help you. So there on the cross, Jesus now begins to minister his last words on earth before being glorified. And the first words out of his mouth with nails in his hands. Nails in his feet, back whip ripped wide open, pushing up and down on a rough-hewed log. The first words out of his mouth was, Father, forgive them. Them? Oh, you don't know what they did to me, Pastor. You don't know what she said. You don't know how it hurt my feelings. Can I get you just to look at Jesus for a minute? And I know that your feelings are real. I know that the pain is real. I know when someone does you wrong that it's real. But can I get you just for a second to look at Jesus with the nails in his hands? To catch a glimpse of him on the cross hanging there looking at the very people that just one week before had been saying Hosanna to the son of David. Now they say give us Barabbas. We'd rather have things our own way. And so go ahead and get rid of this Jesus. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Can you look around your life and think about somebody that's done you wrong? I mean, really wrong. Not just hurt your feelings, not just cut you off in traffic. Somebody that just did you wrong. Jesus was teaching from the cross. When you've been done wrong, catch a glimpse of Jesus. He didn't deserve it, but he took it. And the first words out of his mouth were, Father, forgive them. We need to learn how to forgive like that, and only God can help you do that. Then he spoke to a, a, a thief, someone that for his own crimes hung beside him. And one of them was saying, if you really are Jesus, 
then you would get us out of this. I don't want to get up too much in your business, but I know that sometimes we want to put God to the test. That if God is real, he'd get me out of this problem. Oh, you mean the problem you got in? You mean the circumstances that you created? You want the Jesus that you've never called on in your life to come to you when you want him to. I'm here to tell you today that he can because he's not the kind of God that holds you accountable for everything that you've done. Because there on the cross was a man who deserved nothing but death, but he said, Lord, just remember me. I deserve what I've gotten. I've earned this punishment. But just remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I like what the preacher said. Jesus stopped dying long enough to turn to a thief, to to turn to somebody that deserved nothing but death penalty and said, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus can save even the worst of us if we trust him. Then Jesus looks down and he sees his mother standing at the foot of the cross standing next to the disciple that Jesus loved. And because family means a lot to God, family means a lot, Jesus looked down at his mother and said, Woman, behold your son. Jesus now passes on the responsibilities of watching out for his mother to his most beloved disciples. That's why we're supposed to love each other. That's why we're supposed to care for those that are losing loved ones. The family of God should never just go about feeling like you're on your own. Because here is Jesus' mother. And women at that, 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 that time couldn't, couldn't, couldn't work. They had to depend upon their sons and their families. And yet Jesus cared enough about them. Can we care enough about each other to lift up those that are going through hard times and let them, them know that even though you may have, air quote, lost your loved one, We're here for you. We're your family. Let us be your sons. Let us be your daughters. Let us be the ones that care for you because God cared for us. And then things got bad. The Bible says that, again, while Jesus hung on the cross for six consecutive hours, that there was darkness that covered the face of that area for three hours, from the sixth to the ninth hour, from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, it was And Jesus, in his own flesh, finally felt the humanity rise up in him. And I believe this is one of the things that Jesus feared the most. He said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Ever felt forsaken? Ever felt like you're on your own? Ever felt like you're going through something that you didn't deserve? Can I help you again? Catch a glimpse of Jesus. You're not alone. Because the Bible says, for the joy set before him. Why did Jesus hang there? Because he was looking beyond the pain. Why did Jesus endure what he endured? Because he was looking beyond the circumstances. And God didn't leave him there. But the Bible says God put him there. And God's not going to leave you where you are. But perhaps God has placed you in a time of difficulty in your life. So that you might realize that Jesus said, I'll never leave you. Nor will I forsake you. I may not always get you out of it but I'll come to you and be with you in it. Somebody just needs to know that God is with you in it. You just need to know that you're not forsaken. I know that you want to get out. I know that I want to get out. But sometimes you just got to trust God and realize God is not forsaken. Then Jesus said, I thirst. And there's words that say perhaps he was thirsting to fulfill a scripture because they had to give him bitter wine to drink. The Bible says that they offered him wine on a on a sponge dipped in gall and gall is a like a, a sedative almost like a painkiller and when Jesus tasted the, the water I mean the wine mixed with gall he didn't take it because he had to endure it all he had to feel every last pain so maybe what he was thirsting for was the souls the people that were dying in sin then at the end towards the end I heard a preacher say Jesus looked back from eternity past and he had to make sure that everything had been done he looked forward into eternity future to make sure that everything was right and then in that moment after six hours of agonizing pain 
He said, it is finished. It is accomplished. The work of redemption for mankind is now finished. The way is now available for anybody that will trust me and trust me to take you from where you are to where God wants you to be. The last word that Jesus spoke was, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. And then of his own accord, he hung his head, breathed his last, and died. And then we know that three days later he got up. But I want to just talk for just a couple of more minutes about that one thing that Jesus said that resonates in my spirit even on today, that somebody needs to know that with everything that you've been going through, with every struggle that you've had in your life, that I can declare over you in Jesus' name that it is finished. You may still have to go through some things in your life. You may still have to endure some some of the difficulties and struggles that life throws your way. But Jesus on the cross made a declaration before heaven and earth, before God and angels, before Satan and demons, that the work that God sent him to do was done. And so now when it comes to whether or not you make it, whether or not you end up in heaven, or whether or not you end up in hell, Jesus said that the way to heaven is finished. The way to be forgiven is finished. The way to come out of your sin debt is finished. The debt has been paid, and Jesus wants you to know today that it is finished. And so I just want to share with you, what does that mean? That means that the price has been paid. The only way that you're really going to realize how good God is is to realize how bad we really are. I know we live in a time, man, that self-esteem and loving yourself and all that stuff is important. But when God looks at you, what does God see? God sees all of us that sometimes in our life fall, and we all fall short of God's glory. You know that the Bible says we're supposed to be perfect? I'll find that verse for you because I know that it's in there. But what do we say all all the time? I'm not supposed to be perfect. Yes, you are. And you know why? Because God is perfect. How can we approach a perfect God? How can we even say we worship a perfect God when we allow imperfection? to be a part of our lives because, well, you know, that's just who I am. I know exactly that's who you are. And God knows that that, that's who you are. But you know why God calls you to be perfect is because he loves you and he grants you grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Grace is God withholding from you what you deserve. Because all of us fall short. We didn't just have fallen short. We fall every day. Come on, we miss the mark every day. We fall short all the time. But just because you fall short don't mean that you're supposed to be comfortable falling short. Just because you can sin doesn't mean that you should sin. But somehow sin has become normalized. Sin has become celebrated. We celebrate it in our music. We celebrate it in what we watch. Don't get quiet now because you know I'm coming down your lane. We've given sin a place in our life and we justify it. We say that that's just how things are. God has called us to a higher standard. So you need to know today that the price has been paid. The Bible says that Jesus paid a price for you if you will surrender to him. Because if you don't belong to him, guess who you belong to? If you are not God's possession, not just God's creation, because all of us are God's creation, but not all of us are God's children. All of you are my friendship family, but only Janine in the house is my real family. Y'all in the room still? So we can all have a relationship, but until we realize that I was lost, told you that that story again, I need some brand new, new stories. I came to friendship one Sunday in the mid-70s. I know it was the 70s because I was wearing platforms, and I still had a natural 
And I was a young teenager at the time. But I was a part of the Friendship Baptist Church family. I know that because I got baptized. I know that because I had a membership number. I know that because I had uh, 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 tithing envelopes with my name on it. I know that because I belong to the youth choir. I know that because my father was a trustee. I know that because my mother was a part of the, the choir. I know that because they told me so. But I wasn't saved. I was a church member, but I wasn't saved. And so I felt it would be all right to come to church a little under the influence. I had been saved my whole life. And so on the way to church, I smoked a little bit of that green stuff that had been left over from my Saturday night. See, don't look at me funny because y'all still got some of your Saturday night in your purse right now. Amen, lights. Come on, somebody. And so I came, because church was very, very scripted, as it is now. I came about 1140. Church used to start at 11 o'clock. And I knew that everybody would be out of the vestibule, so I could come in the side door. Came in the side door, sat up there, right about where those folks are sitting now. Had my shades on, chewing my bubble gum, which was a great indicator something was wrong. Reeking of half a bottle of cologne. Come on, somebody. You know how you try to cover up? And I sat there, and the preacher was preaching about sincerity. He said, you can be sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. He said, a man used to have to take heart medication at 12 o'clock, and he knew it was always in the lower right-hand corner of the medicine cabinet. So he didn't even have to turn the light on. He could go over there at midnight and grab the bottle and take his pill and go back to bed. Well, he didn't know that the medicine had fallen out and his wife had put things back and now what was in the corner was not his medicine. And he sincerely thought he had taken his heart medication, but he was sincerely wrong. And he sincerely died. And I sat up there and I knew that man was talking to me. He'd never met me before in my life. But it was like his hand was 47 feet long. And every word he said was just speaking to me. You're sincere. You go to church. God knows your heart. But you ain't saved. You have yet to repent of your sin. You were bold enough to come into what they call, I'm talking about me now, to come into the house of God, bringing with you but you'd be embarrassed if your own parents saw you doing. And that you come into the place where you hear my word and think I'm fine with it. And I started crying and shaking. I wasn't that hot. But I was under the absolute conviction of the Spirit of God. And when he gave the invitation, it's like somebody held me by the back of my neck and picked me up. And walk down the aisle. And they're looking at me, isn't that Fletcher's boy? What's he coming down there for? Because I knew I was lost. I knew that if I died with my shiny Trans Am in the parking lot, if I died with that little bit of money in my pocket and a little bit of esteem I had with my friends, that I was going to hell. I knew that. Because for me, hell was real. Hell has become a kind of a nebulous thing now. There's no real hell. That's why we do what we do. Because we really don't believe. That's why we don't tell our friends about this Jesus, because we really don't believe that there's a hell. Because if we did, we wouldn't do what we do. We wouldn't be so comfortable doing what we do. But the Bible says that Jesus paid the price and that I'm no longer my own. The Bible says that I was bought with his blood. And then the Bible asks the question, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that you're not your own? And when I started realizing that, I started living different. Have I fallen? Oh, yeah. I've had my Romans chapter 7 moments. Y'all ever read Romans chapter 7? Romans chapter 7, Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Anybody had a Romans 7 moment? Don't leave me hanging out here. But I began to realize that when Jesus said, it's finished, 
I needed to say it was finished. See, because God says it's finished, but until you agree for you, it's still going on. Jesus died to pay a price so that you would not have to live under the guilt of your past. There's somebody in this place today. You're still living under the guilt of what somebody said about you years ago or what you did to somebody years back. Jesus said, I want to cancel that. I want you to know that the guilt of your past, if you'll trust me, it's finished. That the insignificance, the the self-esteem issues, that if you'll put your faith in me, it can be finished. The doubt and the fear of who I think I am and who I think I'm not, Jesus can declare that over you, it's finished. If you're here today, I want you to know that God says to you that your struggle with sin can be finished. Not that you won't deal with it, but the guilt of it, the weight of it, the consequences of it. Because there are consequences. You might have been escaping it because you haven't had it catch up with, with you yet. But as the old saints would say, keep on living. What's done in the dark will come to the light. How many of you had the light of your darkness shine in your face? And I just know I got no excuse. Come on. Anybody just been busted? Can I tell you another story? A friend of mine going to, and I going to in and out and we left in and out but he forgot to turn his headlights on. And so we went out to the bowling alley out there at Hastings Ranch back when I was just the Hastings. It wasn't the bowl around And all of a sudden we pulled up in the parking lot. Lights. Boom. Hit the back of the car. I turned around and said, who the? I was a little more expressive in my language at the, at the, at the time. Who the? heck is that? And by the time I turned back around, a sheriff from Temple City was knocking on the window. And I rolled down the window. (laughs) Oh, get out the car. What's that? Oh, that's just a little hash, sir. But it's not an ounce. So that's a misdemeanor, right? He said, oh, no. That's what you call a controlled substance. Watch your head. And I sat in the drunk tank, listening to people throw up, promising God, Lord, if you get me out of here, I'll never do it again. Long story longer. Never went to trial. Never had to face a judge. Never made it to my record. And for about a week, I was good. But then I said, you know, I just, I just don't need to carry it on me. <laughs> and I began to devise new ways of doing the thing that I was guilty of. Come on, I'm not alone. You don't know how easy it is to devise new ways of doing bad stuff? And somehow we, we realize or we believe that God's not going to hold us accountable. But there's coming a time where God's going to hold you accountable for every single thing. I know this world doesn't tell you that. I'm here to tell you because I love you. That when Jesus said it's, it's finished, that debt is canceled. Just like my record was not even expunged. It never even went to trial. God can do that for you. You still got to deal with consequences. Man, I feel like I'm ministering today like I hadn't planned on ministering. Because I think I'm talking to somebody this morning. That's where you are. 
And God wants you to know today, I don't know who you are or where you are, but if you'll trust him, God can declare over your life, it's finished. Running from things that aren't even chasing you is finished. Carrying guilt from circumstances that are past, it's finished. Walking under the weight of what could have been, God can say, it's finished because the price has been paid. But watch this. When he pays the price, your position has been restored. Here's what I believe. When Adam and Eve lost their rightful place, they lost not only dominion, they lost the ability to subdue the earth. Remember what God said? He said, go and subdue the earth. And Satan knew that if they could get out of the garden, then his plan would never work. Satan knows today that if you'll leave this place without this understanding, God wants to restore the power that you as his child can exercise in the earth. Jesus said that when you walk with me, that whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. That nothing will be impossible for you if you will trust me. Because all they had to do was trust God and they could subdue the whole world. Jesus came to put you back into a right relationship with him. Go with me real quickly to Ephesians. I promise you I'm almost done. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul says, Therefore I also, after I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened so that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his power which he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Go to chapter 2. Man, I'm trying to cut this short. Chapter 2 verse 4 says, But God who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love, which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you know that in Jesus Christ, that you have already been raised up and seated in heavenly places? The problem is, is that we don't understand what that means in our lives. When Jesus walked through this world, nothing was impossible to him. He had to face all the challenges that the world threw at him, but he never was in a place of lack. He could speak into broken things, and broken things got better. He could speak to people that were blind, and they could see. He could raise the dead. Can I tell you today that I believe this resurrected Jesus wants to do the same thing in your life? That he wants to return you to that place that Adam lost. Where we can simply ask God, Lord, what do you want for my life? And God will do it. How did you get to where you are today? You think it's your education? You think it's your family name? You think it's your bank account? It is only by the grace of God that you have what you have. And that you are where you are. And if you haven't yet received it, I'm here to tell you today that God can cancel every attack of the enemy in your life. For some of you, the reason why you haven't crossed that milestone is because you're still trying to do it yourself. I got this skill. I got this talent. I got this flow. I got this bank account. You know how many people got skills and talent and flow and money that never, ever make it? But there's a God that I serve today that can cancel every attack of the enemy in your life and say that your season of struggle is finished. I believe that when Jesus said it is finished, that he was speaking that to us. 
the price has been paid. Our position has been restored. When I walk with God, I truly walk in the power. Remember the prodigal son? Anybody ever played the fool in their life? Don't raise your hand. And you messed up something really, really good in your life? The prodigal son was like that. The prodigal son had everything that he needed, but he wanted more. The father gave him exactly what he wanted, and he wasted it. Came to himself and said, I'm not even worthy to be called a son. I'll just go back home. And when he got back home, the father did three things. He put a robe on him. Fresh out the pig pen. A robe is a robe of, of honor and favor. God will put something on you, child of God, that the world never can. When you walk in the favor of God, just the favor of, of God, doors that you didn't even know existed will open. People will talk about your name in rooms you haven't even entered yet. They'll hear about you before you get there because God has put his robe of favor back on you. And he also gave him a ring, a signet ring, which guaranteed him the authority. You now represent the family. And as a child of God, when you represent God, everything God desires for you, no one can keep it from you. When God returns the robe, the ring, and the sandal, slaves and servants went around barefoot. And a son came home as a servant and a slave. And the father restored him. And he said, now everything I have belongs to you. Your days of wallowing in the pig pen are finished. The guilt of your past is finished. The weight of those who sought to keep you down in Jesus' name today is finished because he paid the price. He restored your position. And he guarantees that you shall now walk in power. Jesus said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses everywhere that you go. When people see the grace of God on your life, that will be witness. Because they'll ask, man, how did you get there? Tell them about your education. Tell them about your friends. But tell them about this God that you serve. Tell them that when Jesus rose, I rose. That when Jesus said it was finished, it was finished for me too. So today, on this Resurrection Sunday, my prayer for each one of you is that if you will trust in Jesus, I mean completely submit and surrender to Him. Stop making excuses for the sin that we just have become comfortable with. It's time to clean house. It's time to say, Lord, I'm truly and completely yours. I want to hear God say, it's finished. Your time in the darkness is finished. Your time wallowing in failure is finished because I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I'm going to ask before we go, just because that was a song that we started with, you came, I might have abundant life, that before we leave, I need to hear that again. That's what he came for. He didn't come to condemn you. He came to set you free. So here's your opportunity. On this Resurrection Sunday, not right now, y'all sing what you're going to sing. On this Resurrection Sunday, will you allow Jesus to become real to you? Will this be more than just a Sunday service? I know what you were expecting, and maybe God just did this for you. Because I, I, I just need to say this. I've got some amazing notes. I spent time, but I believe God took me off the page today just, just a little bit. To let somebody know this is not just a Sunday service this is not just Easter this is a chance for you to experience resurrection what people spoke over you as dead what you thought was over God can breathe new life into it and everything about your past if you trust him it is finished in Jesus name Father God in the name of my Savior. 
Lord, I pray today that someone would come to realize that they've been struggling with things, oh God, that you said they shouldn't be. That that season should have ended long ago, but we persist in doing things our way. So we put you first there, Lord. We trust in you. And we realize that you died for us so that we might live. We realize, Lord, that you paid the ultimate price so that we wouldn't have to. And so I pray deliverance over your people. I pray life over your people. I pray, oh God, an end to a season of darkness and the beginning of a season of light and life, love, joy, and power. Do these things, oh God, for your great name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and praise God. Listen, you can thank God if you were blessed by that at, at all. But here's where the rubber meets the road. What are you going to do? What do you do with this message? Just file it away and go back? Or do you say, Lord, I know you came for me. I know today this message is for somebody. I feel that not just an unction in my spirit. I feel like that's a compelling word. There's somebody you've been going through some things and you've been carrying some weight that God wants to end. He wants to remove it. And as long as you keep trying, you're going to keep struggling. Stop trying and let God do the thing. Trust God today with your past, your present, and your future. And I can all but guarantee you that your life will change because I declare my life and over your lives. What God says is over. It is finished. So if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, here's what you do. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that means that it's no longer you in control, but he's in, in control. And you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, right here today you can be saved. You can leave knowing I'm not going to hell. I'm not going to be the subject of punishment forever. I am now part of God's family. That decision can be made today if you will make it. You don't have a church home? Come on. Friendship Pasadena? There's a place for you here. There's a place for you to grow, a place for you to get equipped and empowered. You can engage your community, enlarge your territory, do everything with excellence because Jesus is coming back and we're going to be ready. So if you're here today, as all of us stand, if, if, if you want to get saved, come and receive Jesus Christ. If you want to become a part of God's family here at Friendship, come and join the Friendship Pasadena Church family. Lord, I lift. Lord, I lift your name on high. Why don't you get saved today? Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you're in my life. Lord, I'm glad you came. You came from heaven, heaven to earth to show.
Jesus says, it is finished. The question is, are you? Are you finished struggling? Are you finished trusting in yourself? Are you finished denying that God even exists? Because if so, as the prophets of social media say, do you. But one day, you will stand in the presence of this Savior and have to tell him why I chose to do things my way. Come on, let Sister Bobby bless us and then we're going to hear what God is doing. Pastor, right. yes, ma'am. first of all, I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak the Praise word of God. God. My heart was filled to overflowing as I looked through the congregation at all the young people that are here today. Would all of you from 17 to 40 stand? Please stand. 17 all to 40. of you from 17. Come on. Look at that. Come on. Look all at these... that. Oh, hallelujah. All well, on young... this Resurrection Sunday, God has a word for you. As he rose, he's raising you up. He's raising, you know, there's enough people in here to form an army. You're now in the army of God. I've been young and now I'm old. And so I'm passing the baton to you. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread so on the behalf of my lord and savior i beseech you to make this world a better place and i even look up there in the choir hey come on down y'all you know what to do but you know god loves you god loves you he wants to use you. Please allow him to use you when you go outside the sanctuary walls to tell others Hello. about Jesus. Hello. He loves you. Amen. Be glorified. Hello. Bring glory to his name. Thank you. Hallelujah. And I love you too. Hallelujah. Listen. I leave you with this. And you may as well have just stayed on your feet because we're about, we about to go. If you will trust God today, if you will take God at his word, what Jesus professed on the cross 2,000 years ago can be the statement of the next phase of your life. Everything that has sought to keep you back everything that has sought to keep you down if you'll trust in Jesus I believe that today we can pronounce over you it is finished come on tap somebody on your shoulder tell them it's finished if you trust God come on let's stand on your feet I need to hear this song go out have an amazing day with your brunches and your family but may God be glorified come on give me that I'm so sorry. I just want to again, and I know what this is all about. Miss Ashley, come on, stand up, stand up, stand up. Ashley is rededicating herself to the church and to the Lord. She's coming back so she can be used. Can you receive her and thank God for her and this playing room for you in Jesus' name? Come on, love her before y'all leave. Let me hear that. <laughs>